Welcome, everybody, to the Brainstream Podcast. Uh, I'm here with Harrison. Hello, hello. We just had a really interesting discussion with uh, James Johnson. James is an individual who has received a brain-computer interface, um, specifically a Utah array, and he's a paralyzed individual who essentially uses his device to control computers um, as well as do fun side projects like um, controlling computers uh, robotic car like actual cars and robotic prosthetics and that sort of thing um this conversation was was super interesting and really inspiring to hear his story on his journey of you know going from from being able-bodied to um you know being paralyzed and um all the issues that 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 come with that as well as his story of you know getting this implant and and how yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm so glad to have these conversations with people who are actually using these these brain implants because I think a lot of times we get excited about the technology as, as we should and we think about what can the tech do. But in the end of the day, we should really be thinking about what can it do for people. And I think that he's a great advocate for that. So yeah, in this episode, um, you'll hear about uh, James's backstory and how which is really important for setting up why he was interested in bringing computer interface interfaces um how he uh coped with becoming paralyzed how he found the study how he used the brain implant um and what he thinks the future of this industry um will be and where he thinks the technology will go so it's a really interesting episode i mean i know colin and i are we had our jaws to the floor the whole time it's an amazing story he's such a good advocate so um i know you'll enjoy it so uh yeah keep listening james johnson is a talented artist interior designer medical professional public speaker and entrepreneur after being paralyzed from a paramotor accident in 2017 james joined pioneering implantable bci research at the casa Colina centers for rehabilitation in southern california through this research, James has accomplished incredible feats, including controlling a prosthetic arm, controlling a computer, playing video games, and driving a car. James, thank you for joining us on the podcast. Oh, you're welcome. Glad to be here. Great. So for our listeners, let's just start with a, a broad overview of who you are. So can you tell us about your background and um, what you've done your life? Well, sure. I um... You know, my, my story actually starts back when I was 14 years old, and I was involved in this group called the Guardian Angel. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the group. They are a group started out in New York, and they what they would do is patrol subways and serve as a visual deterrent to crime. And so... The group uh, migrated to Southern California, Los Angeles, and I heard about it through a friend, and I ultimately joined up. So while we're in the group, we did a lot of great things. Uh, there was even one point where we stopped a rape from happening, and I arrested the, uh, the uh, perpetrator. And uh, you're involved at 14, he said. You started at 14. 14. Wow. Yeah. So I always knew that I wanted to do something for the public, but um, I didn't really have a clue what I would end up doing. Well, anyways, that's like a story. Okay. When I, we were on a patrol and we came across this uh, nightclub, uh, the owner was having to be outside in the front. So I was walking by. He asked us if we would help him out because there were some guys inside that were kind of causing a lot of trouble, right? So he was concerned. So we said, sure, you know, we'll hang out for a while until the police get here. And little did we know that our presence would serve as the catalyst to you know, some really crazy events to come. Uh, ultimately, the club owner decided to close down 
early. So people were getting let out, being let out. And they were upset because, you know, it's closing early, right? In that, that crowd was probably about 60% gang back here. And uh, we had a group of nine uh, angels, right? Including myself. And uh, so when we saw that these game makers were uh, starting to act up, uh, we decided to move on the southeast corner uh, from the club. And we waited for the police. Now, this happened July 7th, 2000, I'm sorry, 1987. And since it was kind of close to 4th of July, when we heard the pop, 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 we kind of thought it was, may have been firework. But it wasn't because there were car windows being shattered from the gunfire. So we started to retreat south of our position. And we were zigzagging between the cars to, because the crowd was chasing us. We were being chased by at least 40 people plus. Uh, and so uh, I was trying to make it between two cars and I got hit. I got shot uh, back with a 357. And the impact of the bullet just threw me down all the way to about 100 pounds, you know, 14 years old. And uh, at that point, I heard the crowd running past me and still shooting at the other guys. So I just played dead. And uh, I waited for the crowd to pass me hoping that they would, you know, just assume that I was dead. Well, when most of the crowd had cleared out, uh, I rose to one knee. I put my hand behind my back. It came, I looked at it, and it was full of blood. So um, I was bleeding pretty bad. And just as I was about to get up, my assailant ran up to me and uh, he had the 357 in his hand. He uh, had a bandana cover in his face, but the bandana fell and I recognized him. And I think that he could tell from my expression that I knew who, who he was. And so he starts looking around, and then he puts the gun to my head, pulls the hammer back, and right at that moment, a siren was coming around the corner. So I guess he had it, and he just took off running. What? Well, yeah, I got up, and... uh there was two offices separating, separated by a fence on both sides. So I went in between the fences, and there was some brush right there. Uh, if you know anything about the guardian angels, they wear these white T-shirts with red angel wing. So I took that shirt off because I wanted to kind of hide out in the darkness. I had all black on underneath that shirt. So, uh, while I was laying there, I was face, facing the street where I had gotten shot. Two guys came back. One of the guys was uh, the one who bled, who uh, shot, shot me initially. And another guy uh, was his buddy, and 
I could hear them speaking in Spanish. Your buddy was calling the other guy stupid for leaving you. And by the way, he was carrying a shotgun. And so we were looking around in all directions to see where I could have gone. And then they just fled because the police were all around. So uh, when I finally was discovered uh, by one of the guys who was watering his lawn, one of the, the owners of the house, houses I was sitting between. And he started to spray me with the water. And I called out to him and him that I was uh, shot and I needed help. So he jumped over the fence to, I guess, check me out, make sure I was, you know, okay. And then he called to his wife and told her to call 911. Finally, the police arrived. But little did I know, they had been looking for me the whole time. And uh, found out that two of the other guys got shot as well. Uh, my friend Eddie got shot in his head and another got shot in the shoulder. But I was uh, definitely the worst off. So that said, when I uh, finally woke up from the surgery, uh, the doctor told me that you were so lucky you were. My all right should have been paralyzed because of how close that bullet was to your spine and the fact that you got up and walked. It could have even made it worse, you know, with how close it was. And so that night when I was on the ground, you know, I had a conversation with God and I asked the wimp uh, if I was going to die that night because get this a month earlier in June June 9th my cousin Nadasha died and uh, so I didn't want to give that grief to my mother because it my family because they had already gone through it all yeah, something like that and so anyways I got an answer back from God he has a very distinct voice but he told me not tonight I got too much work and so I recovered uh, kind of messed up you know from the surgeries and all that but eventually I was, I got back to my normal self. I didn't suffer, suffer any psychological uh, issues because I live in the hood. we used to people getting shot. And I was still, no big deal. Uh, but then it is a big deal. What well, happens to you? Yeah, wow. I mean, I can just interrupt very briefly that James, we've spoken before, um, you know, and we've spoken before in preparation for an event that, that we did together at Society for Neuroscience in, in San Diego. And we talked about, um, your amazing life story and the work that you've done. And I mean, you just told me that you were shot in the back, like you glossed over that pretty quickly and, and wow. I mean, it's, that is, that, that's a lot. That's an incredible um story and yeah i mean i think we're both at a little bit of a, a loss for words but um yeah, you know you're, you're hearing really that and then just person. like in that yeah and just in that moment the the thinking about your family and then you know we'll let you get to that point but just the continued service i i um i think it's amazing and important to hear how all of these pieces come together but i'm sorry for interrupting i'll uh, let you keep going yeah so you know in response to what the message I got from God, I uh, thought that 
my life would be um, in the field of serving people and helping people save their lives and whatnot. As a matter of fact, one year later, I was 15 years old, and at the group, the Guardian Angels, we learned CPR and you know first aid, and as well as martial arts. Um, one of my neighbors uh, was found down, and his wife came out. She was screaming, panicking, and went over to their apartment when I saw her husband down on the ground. And uh, I, I immediately knew what to do. I checked his post, couldn't find one. So I instructed his wife to give him artificial breaths while I did compression. And so we did, if we performed CPR, and uh, when the paramedics came, they hooked him up to the machines and he had a heartbeat. So ultimately he survived a uh, biz ordeal. So that's the first time I was able to assist in saving someone's life. And that more than solidified my path um, to become my first respiratory therapist and then a uh, registered nurse. And uh, some 40 years later, after that, uh, here I am doing exactly what I thought I needed to be doing, you know, the, in terms of the medical field. But got to find out that that wasn't what I was intended to do to satisfy that part that I made with God. So here I am, I'm doing all this stuff, flying paraboler, that, you know, all this adventurous stuff, going hiking and camping with my family and doing all this stuff, right? Well, one day, my paraboler wouldn't start. So, and I, I changed the spark plug and was burning some new gas in it. So I decided to take it around the corner, around my block, and burn that fuel through. So prime the carburetor or the fuel pump. And so uh, I did that for maybe 10 yards away from me, where I crashed was my house. I hit something on the road. And the gold cart just kind of handled and rolled over it and broke my neck in. Oh, wow. and, yeah. So, being in the medical field, I understood the cascade of events to come from the intubation to the final fusion to recovery, rehab. And I just kind of set my mind to, okay, here we go. And, uh, yeah, that's how it happened. Wow. So the, the gunshot wound didn't even, um, affect your mobility. It was the, 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 um, the later incident with the, with the go-kart. Right. The irony of things is kind of felt like I was living on borrowed time, sort to say, because by all accounts, I should have been paralyzed back when I was 14. And so again, when I was laying on the ground after the parable accident, same question. Am I going to die tonight, Dr. No tooth in the evening? And again, he said, no, got too much work for you to do. Now, mind you, when I went to the hospital, I coded twice. So... I could have died at any one of those bullets. And uh, I became sept almost septic because I had pneumonia, both love. And I was in a pretty bad way. 
my heart kept growing at uh, bradycardic, which is means that it falls below 60 beats per minute. Uh, I think mine was running around 40 in the 40, which is not, uh, it's, it, you can't live with a heart rate that's 40 unless you're Lance Armstrong or somebody, you know, I thought athlete and I was far from there. Well, but yeah, so I had to have an external pacemaker to regulate the speed of my heart. And I uh, was intubated, uh, sedated. Uh, I suffered a lot of associated injuries uh, relative to having a acute spinal fracture. Wow. So two close calls, um, it seems like. And um, it seems like you've grown a lot in terms of like figuring out, you know, what you're, what to make a mission out of those experiences and like how to make a mission out of those experiences. Um, that's it. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm lost for words. What a story. Yeah. What I want to to prompt on next is, so you you've spoken about um, the the first time you were nearly paralyzed, you had this conversation, um, and uh, God told you that you still had work to do, right? And you did all of this medical work and continuing to um, to to try to help people. And so now now that you're paralyzed, you, you understood because of your, your medical background, what that means in terms of what you will and won't be able to do, but you know, you still had work to do. So what work did you do and how did you carry that? How did that outlook carry you forward? Right. Um, you know, for the onset of my accident, um, and I'm sorry to bring my religion into it. You know, make it, make it personal. Well, this is your story. <laughs> wow. From the onset, God has been with me every step of the way. As I in fact, the first person on the scene to assist me was uh, happened to be walking to by. He's a flight nurse for Long Island Death. So he does critical care flight, uh, takes care of flight patients that they have to fly uh, from all over the place uh, back to Mawalenda. So he knew what to do as far as stabilizing me and make sure I don't further injure my neck. And uh, uh, that was the first. When I was in Mawalenda, I know. First, I got the ambulance and by. At that time, when I was put in the ambulance, uh, I blacked out. And then the next thing I woke up at, not the not low really that. Uh, everybody had reached a medical center in San Bernardino, California. Uh, I was already on the ventilator. I had been intubated already. And they put me in uh, like a halo traction to kind of stabilize my neck and prepare me for a spinal fusion search. So after that happened, I got transferred down to Anaheim uh, because I worked for Kaiser. So they transferred me down to Kaiser Hospital. And uh, just further recovering, suffered another bout of pneumonia. I ended up getting the trait. That's why I kind of talked the way I talk, because I, my chest is still paralyzed while I breathe through my diaphragm. And uh, so I have to, the number of words on one breath is, after it's measured, you know. So 
anyways, after I recovered at the hospital, I was on every drug and all the bad. And uh, so I had really sedated once in time. But eventually I moved to Costa Colina, where I started the rehab therapies. And I was in speech therapy one day when Melissa, Melissa, she's head of the IT department for our physical therapy. And she's, she's responsible for introducing us to, uh, adopt, adoptive, uh, equipment such as my Tetra mouse that's in front of me right now. It's what I use to control the computer when I looked up to the BCI. And she came up to me one day, she said, I thought about you because there's this project that's, uh, they want to do with Caltech. And, and, but the thing is, it involved brain surgery. And I said, okay, what kind of project are you talking about? Oh, I will call me gay brain surgery. I imagine that they don't have a light around the corner for that. <laughs> but you're like, what are you getting me into? For sure. Right. But uh, she's like, no, you just, I got to introduce you to uh, the team. And uh, just figure all out, see what they have to say about it. And I said, well, are there any other participants in, the, in this particular project? And she said, uh, well, they actually had another person uh, named Stancy. And you know that, too. Harris Evans. Yes. So they wanted to introduce me to her to get a, her perspective. At that time, Nancy had already been involved in BCI research, right? Right. She was still in Russia. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Well, I said, okay, well, let me see what they have to say. So I met with uh, Tyson and the group and Dr. Parati and Mater. And uh, they, well, Dr. Parati explained to me how the procedure would work and what area of the brain uh, the implants would be. And had the, uh, you know, I kind of understood most of what he was talking about in terms of the chips sitting on top of the gray matter as opposed to the white matter. The gray matter is on the outside. It's your kind of like your epithelial level. And then the white matter is where your neural network is. Yeah, so just, just for our listeners, because um, they're usually the people listening are familiar with a little bit of neurotech. So in case you're interested, um, these are Utah arrays, correct? So these are very, very small um, electrode grids that have 100 electrodes, and they penetrate only about a millimeter, millimeter and a half into the surface of the brain. Um, but that surface area that James is talking about, the cortex, um, has a lot of uh, higher level functions, whether it's sensory information or motor signals. So you can actually make really great brain computer interfaces um, out of that. And actually, while we're on that topic, James, um, where are your brain implants? Which ones, uh, like how many do you have? So I have two implants. One is in the parietal lobe. And I know it's responsible for action. And what is in the peripheral lobe? And that lobe is re responsible for planning. So that said, we're able to, well, the Caltech guys were able to figure out uh, and differentiate between me planning to do something versus me actually doing something. It's incredible. Sure. So that, that one, sorry, that one that you said in the peripheral lobe, is that, um, so is that more up? in the front here? Is that what, what you're saying? They're, they're both towards the back. 
Towards the back, yes. Okay. So are they both in the parietal lobe? Um, no. Just the one in the parietal lobe is uh, separate from the one in the uh, peripheral. Um, I'm trying to remember the term that they, they used. But uh, it's just at the back of my head. Just out of curiosity, you, you've mentioned, you know, religion a lot in your story. Um, did that have any, did that weigh into your decision making at all in terms of like whether or not you were interested in getting a brain computer interface implant? I've heard from some people uh, that like, you know, because they're so religious, they're not as interested in having something implanted um, in their brain. Um, was that ever an issue for you or did you sort of feel that like, this was the plan that, that like God had laid for you at that point. Yeah. Um, it, it, it had a major uh, effect on my decision to go through with the uh, surgery because, you know, you have to understand when something like that happens to you, uh, you just feel like you lost everything. And that, not only your physical ability to do things, but all the things that are associated with it, like privacy, uh, having to deal with strangers coming to your residence to take care of you. And so it's just a, a cascade of events that follow the injury and how it weighs on your family. It takes its toll on everybody. And so that said, you have to imagine how heavy the depression uh, would be, you know, what was for me. And to the point where you, and I've talked to other BCI candidates, there's that point where you're like wishing you were dead so that you'd be better off or wishing that you could commit suicide. But then you ask yourself, how the hell can I commit suicide if I can't move, right? Well, there's that conundrum. Well, uh, but fortunately for me, and not everybody has uh, the port that I had. But I have friends, co-worker, family. I mean, just a circle of support that really pulled me through. Uh, I did seek uh, help from a psychiatrist. And, you know, growing up in a you just go to a psychiatrist or anything like that. There's a bad stigma associated with it. But, uh, I just wanted to say to anybody who feels that they uh, need to talk to somebody, I'm a very big advocate for that field because without the help from my psycho psychiatrist, uh, it would have been that much more difficult to pull myself through to even be able to uh, do what I'm doing now. So when I decided on the, well, after I got that insight from Dr. Nader or Karate and then Tyson and the other Caltech team member, um, I was all for it because I never felt like it, like I, like scared or fearful or, you know, about the procedure. I, I thought, well, if God's got me, uh, if he's got something for me to do, work to do, then he'll see me through uh, the surgery. And by all accounts, he has. Wow. That's great. Yeah, yeah actually, story? absolutely. Yeah. Um, actually, just to, to back up on, on that a little bit. So... We've talked about how you come to finding out about the research and getting the surgery, and then also the reasons why that you, um, you know, were told that this is part of your purpose and and 
the the work that you'll be able to do to to benefit humanity. Um, but when you first met Nancy, when you first heard about brain computer interfaces, what was going through your mind about what was possible and what did you think about what you would be able to do or what that would mean for your injury? Yeah, of course. After I understood the um, the process, uh, I knew that uh, VCI was up in Hermie. Uh, you know, we're not all the way where we want to be in terms of control and view. But I thought, well, if I could contribute to the project um, and also offer a perspective from someone who does have a medical background, because uh, I assume that we don't really have a lot of medical professionals who have undergone this particular procedure. So I thought I, this was a way for me to start giving back again, to start doing what I love to do. And I talked it over with my family. My wife was present when we spoke with the team. And she was like, are you sure? And I said, what else? What else am I going to do? You know? And God told me that I got to do some work. And I, I really feel like this was it, right? So I thought, okay, well, the benefit that I want to see ultimately is to have the technology uh, available for like prosthetic limbs. So to wear uh, wounded surgery, sur soldier can operate up harm and uh, just with his brain and uh and one of the things that I mentioned before I ever said it. When I'm operating a uh, robotic arm, when it goes to grasp an object on the table on fairly cup, pin or whatever, I can feel it because I get a tactile feedback based on my uh, visual memory of having performed that task when I was a paralyzed. And now, so you talked about this very briefly. You were saying that even without sensory stimulation coming from the BCI, that it, when you saw that arm reach out, that it you felt like you could feel the fingers, right? Am I correct? Well, right. And so amazing to think about the the brain adopting that arm almost as a part of you that you're able to see it move out and, and feel like that's a part of yourself um that's at least that's what i'm understanding from what you're saying and that's really really fascinating to think about right imagine imagine a soldier coming home you know he's got a arm or a leg amputated they fill with a prosthetic and then his sensory uh, pretty much can pick up where he left off before he got amputated, you know? He can get that feeling back when he goes to hug his kid, white, you know? So, I also, uh, when we were over at the SIN, I spoke with the gentleman who developed the, uh, Robotic arm, but I don't know if you saw that. Oh, yeah. And one's with prosthetic attachment. And what he uses is uh, FES, which is functional electric stimulation. So the arm that he was wearing responds to the muscles that are, uh, that it's attached to, uh, like the triceps and the biceps. And I was talking to him about marrying BCI to FPS and that way all the sensory feedback that I experience uh they need to be just married to the FES they can experience the same thing plus have the mobility and function of an R because that was really really interesting 
let, let's talk a little bit about specifically about your implant. Um, great. I mean, this story is incredible. Um, I like I, I I can't believe you've went through so much at so, like throughout your life. You've lived like three lives. It seems like yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I want to say too before we get into the technology, which we will do in this next piece, because I want to hear um, and share with our listeners what you've been able to do with it. But what I really appreciate about you sharing that story and sharing it in detail and sharing it personally is that I think in the neurotech community, especially younger people, which is most of our audience, we get really excited about, oh wow, what can the tech do? Wow, somebody controlled a prosthetic. Wow, they did this. But I think it's really important for people to hear your perspective in terms of like why are these devices actually important and what do they need to do to really help people and then also understand the broader picture of having an injury and being paralyzed is not it, it's it's so many different things there's the there's the uh, mental component as well and then thinking about family and i just i think that that's really important to hear so yeah i just wanted to interject that because you know, again, thank you for for sharing that and sharing it in detail. And I think it's important for yeah. people to hear. But yeah, with that said, um, you know what what Colin was was getting to there. So what? Um, so we, you've talked about the prosthetic arm. What other applications have you have you been able to do um, with your brain computer interface implant? Well, um, so after we worked with the prosthetic arm. Um, Tyson asked me, "Hey, Jane, I know you're a game, you're a gamer, but uh, have you been able to play any games with your uh, adaptive equipment?" And I said, "No, because you know the games that I want to play, first-person shooters require um, multiple aspects of controlling, uh, you know, controller." So. I can only work on a computer with a uh, Tetra mouse, right? With my mouth. And my hands are paralyzed. I can't move my fingers. So therefore, I can't con control the, the game. And he said, so what if we were able to get like an open source game and try to conduct you with your BCI implant? I said, wow, I mean, well, that would be cool if you guys can do that. And so that's what they did. They worked on it, and uh, eventually I was able to control first-person shooters. And I believe I showed you some of the footage on it. Well, but, uh, yeah, every aspect of the game, from aiming, advancing, shooting, uh, ducking, all all the what I do is I imagine myself with a PlayStation controller in my hand, and what they do is they map out the neurons responsible for a certain appendage, like my index finger. And uh, once they map it out, they develop an algorithm that they can then feed into the computer. And that computer will take that function and apply it to what we want it to apply. And in, and in that case, it was the controlling the video game. So, yeah, I was back to game. Now, yeah. one more plot. That is, that is so cool. And yes, you did show me a video um of you playing and it was quite impressive like you were saying like you were playing like you were playing a complex game with multiple buttons with multiple elements going on and at least from the video i saw it seemed pretty intuitive like you were you were able to do that which um was just so fascinating to see that the technology is there and one thing that i want to call back to is it's very interesting the research that you and nancy are a part of that there's a focus on the parietal lobe. Um, and specifically, at least I know for Nancy, I'm not entirely sure um, with your implant, but I know for hers, it was in an area called the posterior um, parietal cortex, which is, as you said earlier, involved in this higher level planning. And traditionally, most of these types of BCIs that are controlling a prosthetic are in 
the motor cortex, so more direct signals. And what I found that's so fascinating from learning about the work that both of you have done is that these brain computer interfaces are working from a broader sense of, okay, I want to do this thing. And you're getting it in that planning stage that you were saying that's where these signals are coming from. And just so fascinating to see that it's able to work and that in some cases you're able to do like things that are like more complex applications because you're starting with where do I want it to end up as opposed to what individual thing do I need to do to make that happen. So I just wanted to point that out that I think that's fascinating. We've heard from other users of the uh, of, of brain computer interfaces that are similar to yours um, that there's a lot of recalibration that's needed to be done um, whenever uh, uh, you start up the device or whenever you you decide to use the device. Have you found that is an issue with your usability of your implant? Like, for example, do you ever have to do you have to go in and like recalibrate it before you start using it? Um, yeah, we recalibrate every session. Because um, it's still a science, and it's not about me doing applications with it. It's about learning the uh, the way the brain works and mapping those neural networks so that they can apply it to uh, an application. So there will be times where the algorithm that we're using is perfect, right? But then we'll go in the next week and, okay, well, that algorithm worked, but we want to try it this way to see if this set would affect this SAS and if this could be better or is it worse. So what they're doing by all the calibration is, is trying to pinpoint something that remains consistent and predictable. And so uh, I never mind having to do calibration all the time. Uh, it doesn't really bother, bother me because the end result is um, getting the most out of the implant as possible. And, and you know, these the implants do have a, they do degrade over time. Even my implants have degraded, and we're having to uh, write new algorithms to compensate for the degradation. And uh, so that said, we were able, well, they were able to write a program that would allow me to uh, have a similar control as to when I first got implanted. So it kind of a bite causes that de degradation. And how long have you had your implants for? Just over five years now. Wow. Yeah, we went from playing, moving dots around on the screen mm -hmm. to controlling robotic limb to playing a first-person shooter, to driving a car. That's all so awesome. <laughs> all right, so tell us tell us about that last one then, because that is that that sounds interesting. Well, uh, Tyson uh, approached me one day. He said, "You know, what do you think about trying to?" create a decoder that will allow you to get behind the wheel of a car. And I thought we were kind of a far way away from that, right, ever happened. I said, well, if you guys could do it, that would be great. You know, he says, so Lori and uh, uh, one of the owners of Black Rock, it's been his dream to have a BCI candidate get behind the wheel of a car. And so he wants to commit to making that uh, dream of his a reality. And based on what he saw from you and your video gameplay and the control there, 
he thought that, okay, this could be possible because he tried it before with um, Ian. Ian is another gentleman who had PCI. So they pretty much, uh, they got to the point where they were get the algorithms together and, you know, driving in simulators, right? So Ian was the first one to drive in the simulators, but wow, uh, at some point he decided to de-implant though. And I believe now kind of works like a consultant, right? And uh, so I picked up off where uh, Ian left off and I started off in the simulator similar to what he was driving in and I had really great control of the vehicle and so with that uh, Florian approached a major car manufacturer and presented the material to them and so they kind of like, oh, okay, well, we'll see where it goes, type of thing, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, they got to work on the uh, they, the the motor company assigned some engineers to uh, pick up the uh, signals from the equipment that we were using, the uh, bus stop Utah array array. And so that they can communicate with each other. Sure. But your system, um, meaning the Utah arrays and all the, the processing computers and everything, is sending a signal, kind of like a remote control, to an actual car. And then they adapted it so that you can control this car from these remote well, areas, right? Well, they... so the first time we got out on the road, I was driving a golf cart because they wanted to see how far it would go. And so, um, the very first time everybody was, you know, gathered around we had cameras and they said, okay, the control is yours. And I drove. And not only did I drive, I was doing figure eight and back and up and, uh, three-point turns, and, you know, all with almost perfect control. And so, now I'm in my house, and the car is 2,000 miles away in Michigan. So you're looking through cameras that are sitting in the, in the car, golf cart. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they had the cameras on the dashboard, and I was able to see the front of the hood. So that gave me an idea of the distance that I have between objects. And then from my perspective here at home, I'm just looking at computer monitors and uh, driving it as if I'm playing a video game. He's just a lot. Yeah. Well, so you got you know, I haven't gotten to the Grand Theft Auto level yet, but <laughs> I've on to that. Now they just hook you up to a robot uh, that can drive the car for you, and then you can get it, move the robot out of the car. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Well, I, I you should go rogue at some point. You know, they're just suddenly the golf cart just skirts off in one direction. <laughs> they're so far. well, we're not. Uh, we're not in a golf cart anymore. Mm -hmm. And while I can't tell you the vehicle that we're driving, um, it is an SUV. It's all electric. Uh, wow. So they're able to interface. So you see like the uh, Teslas, they have a big high path in the middle. Yeah. So this particular vehicle, they're able to interface with it and control the car. Because, you know, electric cars, they have um, safety features that will correct you if you're crossing lane, brake, and stuff like that. So, and the car that I'm driving is semi-autonomous, and uh, but I have the option of controlling it, yeah, entirely myself. 
when my thoughts. And so most time I'm just controlling it up with my thoughts and I'm taking full control. So over in Michigan, they have this, uh, call it M city. You guys could probably look that up. But most of the major car manufacturers over there, they, this testing track for their vehicles and it's a mock up city that's about maybe a, a square mile. And uh, you have a mock uh, freeway that you can merge on to, and, you know. Sure. Well, yeah, it's hard. Been... Yeah, I definitely recommend anyone who's listening to look it up because it's, it's very cool. You have like all your fake buildings and yeah, you can set up a, a whole little track and that's very cool. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, the plan is for the not so distant future is to get me close to the car because we still have to deal with the issues of latency with the Wi Fi connection. And one sometimes we'll get lag and stuff and the car looks like it's doing one thing when I can't see it doing another. So that's why we have a safety team inside the vehicle uh, to put on the brakes. So in order to eliminate that issue, either I am going to fly off to Michigan or we'll set something out here in like the salt. So uh, Marsh. Uh, like the salt and the yeah. area and just drive crazy as we want to drive. <laughs> That's fine. Like, and would you be in the vehicle at that point or near? At that point, um, because we've got to work out all the, the bug to where, and also how I would fit in the vehicle. How I, my body would be small. Support it, uh, type of thing, deal. So, it's a lot of engineering that's going to go into it. Well, but, uh, you know, these, this car manufacturer has the pocket, so they can afford it. There you go. Yeah, have some fun for sure. That's cool. Oh. And and I want to point out too that there there has been, I've seen projects or research examples before where someone may have used a brain computer based technology, whether it's an implant or maybe EEG to go forward. And then like basically turn on the accelerator, turn off the accelerator, turn on, turn off, but someone else has to steer and brake and all those things. And what I want to make sure everyone who's listening can understand what I'm understanding from what you're saying is that you have full control. You can go forward and backwards and you can control, you know, your speed. And then you can go left, you can go right so that you can do all these fun things like your figure eights and three point turns. And I just, I want to make sure that everyone listening understands how big of a deal that is. I mean, that's, that, this is full car control that we're talking about. And so when, when you are doing this, what are you thinking of to get the car to turn right or left or move at different speeds? Um, we have a few different techniques that we or exploring what is to map out my uh, finger control. So kind of like a joystick that you could push forward, pull back, like a flight control joystick. And then on the top of that joystick is a, a thumb button, right? So that thumb button is the brake, right? And I can move the brake or the thumb button forward to brake slightly or brake harder, even faster forward. And then if I want to excel, then I imagine myself pushing a um, joystick forward, left or right, right? But lately, we've been working on uh, this device called a HoloLens by Microsoft. An AR, AR device, yeah. Wrong well, in reality, yeah. Yes. The difference between this one and the Oculus is that the HoloLens, uh, you're not inside the 
uh, a, an environment like a augmented reality type of environment. What the HoloLens does is it's a pair of glasses with a helmet, a tactical helmet, that has all the electronics. And it maps out your environment. So the distance between me and an object, distance between the table and the wall, all of these things are mapped out um, so that when I'm moving uh, within a 3D environment, I'm able to uh, able to use that mapping as a guide for my thoughts to reach a target. So let's say I have a soda can on the table. I can project, predict the distance from where my thoughts are at to that particular uh, soda can. And if I were, if I'm controlled, robotic arm, then I know the distance in a three-dimensional space, just like you uh, and everybody else. If you want to reach for something, you just do it. You grab it and it's done. You know, it's not even a thought of how distant the object can be. If you're driving on the road, you can already have an idea of the distance between you and the stop sign. So you start preparing ahead of time. You don't just land on a brake once you hit the stop sign. The last part of the peripheral low is the planning low. And uh, what we've been doing with the HoloLens is we're working more on trying to use my mind as opposed to mapping out uh, digits by my fingers. So almost complete telepathy, sort of say. And with that, I'm able to move object in a 3D environment. Now it's a VR almost kind of environment due to Holloway. But what we do is we put uh, points of contact in various places in a three-dimensional place. Some are further, some are closer, some are lower, some are higher. So instead of a 2D XY, then we have a 3D XYZ. And so just by pushing the object with my thought, with my mind, I'm able to move and land on each particular landing uh, with pinpoint accuracy. That's incredible. It's it's fascinating to hear how intuitive that is for you. It sounds like once you learn how to do something, it's like, okay, you know, just like, um, just like I can reach out and pick up a cup, you can do that with the robotic arm and you just learn how to operate it. So yeah. that is really fascinating. Now, we are coming up here on time, so I want to roll through just a, a couple more things I want to ask you um, quickly here. So what, one question um, that I've been wondering is, has this experience of using technology to, to augment your body, it, getting into these brain computer interface um, studies, has this changed how you think about the limitations that you face and your disability? Um, for you now, and do you see how do you see this changing in the future? Well, one of the biggest things that uh, paralyzed paralyzed people want more than anything is independence. The ability to go to the refrigerator and pick up something to stack on, you know, without having to call somebody to do it for you. Or even just going to the bathroom, you know, your modesty goes out the window. That's life. And so you have to kind of surrender to always having someone in your personal space. And uh, but other than that, 
I feel that uh, pro these projects have a purpose to serve a broader community, and we are on the cusp of something revolutionary because I liken it to how when back in the nineties we went from pagers to car phones to smartphones relatively within a twenty year span. Um this tech right now is pushing up on fifteen years with human trial. So me having been in it for five years, you can see how far we've gone just based on what I'm doing. And I can see that. So I believe that in a not too distant future, a lot more people will be able to benefit. There'll be greater technology. The uh, Utah array will be more refined to it like a Bluetooth or a multi function. Uh, in, fact, in fact, that's what they're working on now, is uh, trying to make it all uh, Bluetooth compatible. So I can ride my wheelchair down cost going to turn all the TVs. Yeah, and, and that sounds like it would be huge for, for independence like you were talking about. And I know yeah, that that it's it won't be long until these before these devices are approved for medical use cases and can become something that someone could receive as an assistive device as opposed to needing to find and join a specific research study and only be able to use it in the lab. So it's really encouraging to hear that. And you know, I, I'm familiar with the work that you've been a part of and the work that many um, who've had brain implants have been a part of, but it will never not amaze me or shock me to hear, um, you know, you talk about what it's like to actually use these devices and to hear from you what you've been able to do. It's, it's just mind blowing.